Now, in Matthew chapter 10, this is where Jesus Christ is sending out his 12 disciples. Just before this, at the end of chapter 9, he had said the famous words, if you look down there in your Bible, verse 36, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. So he says, the harvest is plenteous, the laborers are few, we need to pray that God will send laborers. Then in the next breath, what's he doing? Sending laborers. So then in the next breath in Matthew 10, he sends out his 12 disciples, and he sends them out to preach and to say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he gives them this big long list of elaborate instructions. And one of the things he tells them is, he says, just for now, just go to Israel. Just go to the cities of Israel, because that's the country that they're in. And he tells them, you know, don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans yet. Just go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But he gives them detailed instructions about what to say, where to go, what to do. Later, of course, in Matthew 28, he expands this and says, hey, go and teach all nations. But he wanted to start first talking to those of Israel in his nation that the scripture would be fulfilled where it said, you know, he came unto his own and his own received him not. But even in this scripture where they're going throughout Israel preaching in all the different towns and villages and cities, one thing that he tells them is he says, look, if you come into a town that's not worthy, if you come into a town that's basically not interested in what you have to say, he says, just shake the dust off your feet of that town, go to the next town, and it's going to be worse for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment. It'll be worse for that town than it will be for Sodom and Gomorrah. Later on, look what he says in verse number 23 of chapter 10. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. So earlier in the passage, in verse 14, he says, Whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Then later he says, hey, if they persecute you in that city, then just go somewhere else. What's he teaching here when it, in regard to soul winning, in regard to evangelizing? He's saying, go to the people that want to hear it. Amen. That's where you should focus your efforts. Find the house where they're worthy. And that's where you want to spend time and abide and preach to those people. And when you get to the house that's not worthy, just leave. When you get to the town that doesn't want to hear the gospel, just leave. Move on. Go somewhere else. Now, this principle is carried throughout the New Testament in many places. But let's go right now to Luke chapter 10 quickly. Flip over to Luke chapter 10. And in Luke 10, we have a parallel passage where he sends them out two and two. And I just want to quickly show you it in this uh, place, verse 10 of chapter 10. But into whatsoever city ye enter and they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of the same and say, even the very dust of your city which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. So the unreceptive city, God says, you know, give them a warning. Make sure that they know, look, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. I'm leaving you with one verse here. I'm just letting you know that salvation's available, that the word of God's here, but I'm going to shake off the dust and go somewhere else that's more receptive. Look at Luke chapter 14, just a few pages to the right in your Bible. Luke chapter number 14. It says in verse 12, Then said he also to him that bade him, when thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came, 
All right, the wind blew my page here. It's a good thing I'm preaching out of the waterproof Bible. <laughs> so that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house being angry said to his servants, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in either the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there's room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Now, of course, this is a parable. It's a story that has a, a spiritual application. The earthly story with the spiritual meaning. And what he's saying is, a guy invited a bunch of people to dinner and they made excuses and they wouldn't show up after he put all the work into this nice dinner. So he gets angry about it and he tells his servants to go out and find the poor, the maimed, the blind, the crippled, those kind of people. And he says, invite them in. And they go out and they invite all of them. And then once they're done inviting all of them, then he says, okay, now go out and just into the highways and, and hedges and just compel them to come in that my, my, my house may be filled. Just invite everybody. Get everybody in here. And this is a picture of us inviting people to be saved because of the fact that right before this, he says, blessed are they that eat and drink in the kingdom of heaven. And he says, it's like unto this supper. Okay. So what the Bible is teaching again is that when we go out and preach the gospel to every creature, we should focus our efforts on the poor, the, the maimed, the blind, the halt. He says, after you've talked to those people, then go to everybody. But why is he saying start with the poor, start with the maimed, the blind, the halt? Here's why. Because of the fact that they are the most receptive to the message. I mean, if you go to a poor person or a handicapped person, they're going to be more likely to want to come to this free meal than some of these rich people that refuse to come to the meal because they just didn't really think it was that cool or whatever. So it's the same way when you go out soul winning. You and I know that people that are uh, very rich or well-to-do type people, sometimes because of pride and they feel like they have it all together, they don't really need salvation in their mind. They don't need the gospel. They don't need church. They don't want to change anything about the way they're living their life to join a church and, and, and be a part of God's house. So God is saying here, go to the people first that are the most receptive, which is similar to what he taught back in Matthew. Now go to the book of Acts because Acts is where a lot of soul winning is going on in the Bible. Acts is a book where they're just constantly out winning people to Christ. The church is growing. Things are happening. They're going out and making something happen and working hard. I mean, just a lot of great... I mean, that's why it's called Acts. What does Acts mean? It's what you do. It's what you accomplish. You know, it's action. It's the works that you perform. And a lot of people today want to de-emphasize the works that we do. Now, hey, by all means, de-emphasize it in regard to salvation because it has nothing to do with salvation. It has zero emphasis on salvation because salvation is by faith alone. Not of works as any man should boast. But after we're saved, God wants us to do some acts, Amen. some works, Amen. you know, some, some action. So look at Acts chapter 13 and see how this principle plays out in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 13, verse 44, it says, The next Sabbath day came also the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it far from you, I'm sorry, but seeing you put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Why are they turning to the Gentiles? Because the Jews aren't interested. He says, Look, you guys have judged yourselves unworthy of the kingdom of God. Fine, we'll just go to the Gentiles. You don't want to hear what we have to say? That's no problem. We'll just go on to the next person. Whether that be a house or a city or a nation or a group of people, he's saying, you know, move on to the people who want to hear it. Look what it says in verse 47. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Watch this. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. Why in the world would you want to just beat your head against the wall 
Trying to reach people who don't want to be reached. Yeah. Trying to give the gospel to people who don't want to hear it. Look, of course we want to just give everyone a warning. You know, you at least just say, hey, look, the kingdom of God's come nigh unto you. Or just say, hey, look, let me just leave you with one verse. But I'm not going to spend hours and hours of my time preaching to people that don't want to hear the gospel. And you say, well, you know, you just need to keep preaching it to them anyway. Don't give up on anybody. Well, here's Paul giving up on people. Amen. Yeah. All throughout the New Testament, it's taught. Move on. Yeah. Shake off the dust of your feet. Why? Because we're living on a planet with 7 billion people. There are plenty of fish in the sea. Yeah. Why would you beat your head against the wall with people who aren't interested when there are plenty of people who are interested? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people in this world who want to hear the gospel, who are ready for you to knock their door, and they are interested in what the Word of God has. There are nations in this world that are more receptive than others. Certain countries, certain languages, where the people are more hungry for the Word of God. That's where the effort should be focused, Amen. biblically speaking. Yeah. And people who just don't want to hear it, time to move on. Why? Because we only have so much time and energy and breath. And if we want to achieve the most that we can for the kingdom of God, it should be with those that are receptive. You say, oh, but there's already a bunch of people saved amongst that neighborhood or that group. Yeah, but the Bible says unto him that hath more shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. Look what the Bible says in Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, look at verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I'm clean. From henceforth, I will go into the Gentiles. Why? Because they weren't listening. They weren't receptive. They didn't want to hear it. He said, I'm going on to somebody else. It says in verse 7, And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house, named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So in this story, again, he tries to give the gospel to the Jews. They don't want to hear it. So he says, okay, well, from now on, I'm just going to focus on the Gentiles in, the, in Corinth. I'm going to preach to the Gentiles. He preaches to them, and he's getting a lot of the Corinthians saved. But he's also getting a lot of persecution and heat from the Jews. So God didn't want him to move on to the next town yet because they were so receptive there in Corinth. So God's given him an assurance by saying to him, Look, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to keep you safe. Don't worry about it. Just boldly preach and let me protect you. Because he's saying, I have much people in this city. There are a lot of people in this city, he's saying, that I know are going to get saved through your work. So don't leave. Stay here because you're going to get a lot of Corinthians saved. And that's worth it to live in the shadow of that persecution if a whole bunch of people are getting saved. I mean, the implication is that if a whole bunch of people weren't getting saved, you'd move on to somewhere where you are going to get more people saved. I mean, that's what he's teaching here, okay? Go to Acts 28. And notice, this isn't just one isolated scripture that we're looking at. You know, we're going to a lot of scriptures that are all reinforcing this principle of focusing our efforts on those who are receptive. Now, how can we apply this practically speaking? Well, first of all, when I go out soul winning, I go into it with this philosophy that we're reading right here, where I'm looking for that house that is worthy. Yeah. You know, and when he says worthy there, what does he mean? He just means somebody who wants to listen, somebody who's willing to listen, as opposed to the person that is hardened and has no interest. So when I go out soul winning, I go into it with a philosophy of finding that house that's worthy, you know, finding that person that wants to hear the gospel. That's why, you know, when I first started out soul winning, I never asked people, hey, is it, can I show you from the Bible how you can know for sure if you die today? I just go right into it. I would basically just walk up to them and say, hey, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? And if they said no, I'd say, okay, well, here's how you can know. And I would just start showing them. 
Now, a lot of people are just too polite to where they just won't stop you, even though they have zero interest, okay? So my philosophy was, well, I just want to give the gospel to everybody I can. So I'm not going to ask them whether they want to hear it because, you know, everybody needs to hear it, right? I mean, that makes sense. And I've, I've known people who do that method, and that's how I used to do it. But you know what I realized, though? I realized I was wasting a lot of time and breath and energy on people who had zero interest in the gospel when there are other people down the street who do want to hear it. So I'd rather go find those people. Now, everybody deserves a warning. Everybody deserves to hear something. So that's why I started asking them, hey, I, I, I find out they're saved, and then I would say to them, can I take five minutes and just show you from the Bible how you can be saved, how you can know for sure you're going to heaven? And if they say, no, no, no thanks, then, I, then what I would do is just leave them with one verse. Because I don't want to just leave them with nothing. So I'd usually quote one scripture to them, Something like John 3, 16, 1 John 5, 13. And then I'll say this. Now, are you, are you sure you don't have a few minutes? You know, after I've given them that verse, sometimes I'll give them another chance of just, you know, if you just got a few minutes, I can show you a little more in case that first verse got their attention. But honestly, if, they're, if they say no, no thanks, you know, I'd rather just move on anyway. I'd rather just give them that one verse, because you're still planting a seed with that one verse and move on to the guy who wants to hear the gospel than to just spend, because I've spent time giving somebody the gospel and they're just kind of like looking around. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And they're zoned out and they're not even paying attention. And then you'll ask them a question, like you'll be going over it, you'll show them, hey, right here it says, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So what does that verse say that you have to be saved, do to be saved? Oh, what? Yeah. <laughs> What's that? I mean, we've all been there. Or you say, you know, hey, well, so what do we have to do to be saved? And then they'll just say something that's not even in that verse because they're not even listening. And I just realized, you know, my time is valuable. You know, God wants to redeem the time. It's a precious gift of God to have time and energy and breath and the word to go preach. We don't want to squander it, beating our head against the wall, especially not just arguing with people that are clearly hardened to the gospel, arguing with Mormons, arguing with Jehovah's Witnesses that have zero interest, you know, instead of, just shaking the dust off our feet and moving on to the next house, the next town. Okay, that's one of the ways that this could be applied in our lives. But you know, it's not just that. Even when I choose an area to go soul winning, I'm going to choose the poor areas. Because let's face it, if we go soul winning, whether it's in Phoenix or Prescott, if we go to the mobile home parks that are the kind of more low income, or the apartment complexes that are a little low income or older neighborhoods, we're gonna get more people saved. So why would we go to the neighborhood where we're not gonna get people saved when we can go to the neighborhood where we will get people saved? Now, yes, it's the mission to preach the gospel to every creature. But he said first go to the poor, didn't he? Yeah. First go to the poor, the blind, the, mind, bleh, the maimed, the blind, the halt. He said, then go out and just invite everybody you can in the highways and edges. But start with the people that are going to be receptive. Start with the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And then do the rest. And here's the thing, where we go in Phoenix, the areas that are receptive areas, we've knocked those doors four or five times. The areas that are unreceptive, we'll go there pretty much once. Shade that, you know, it's like, hey, be sure to shade that in on the map because I don't want, you know, we don't want to accidentally do this again. You know, and I'm sure, you know, 10 years, 20 years down the road, you know, we'll, we'll go through and do everything a second time. But I'd rather go five times to the area where people are being saved. Right. Amen. Yes, we want to go everywhere. Yes, we want to give everyone a chance. But we need to focus our efforts on the people that are more receptive. If there's a certain nationality that's more receptive, focus on them. You know, if there's a certain demographic, certain area, certain part of town, it just makes sense and it's biblical. That's what the Bible teaches. That we, There's no glory in just saying, well, you know what? I know that the Jews are the most unreceptive people on the planet, but you know what? I'm just going to dedicate my life to just only giving them the gospel and just beating my head against the wall with that. You know what I mean? It just doesn't, or, or you know what? I'm just going to go to the most died in the wall, die hard Mormon town and that's where I'm going to minister. It's like, and none of them want to hear the gospel. It's like, what are you doing, you know? Yeah. I'll tell you what, if I were pastoring in Utah, 
I would probably, I'd probably focus more of my time on the non-Mormons, yeah. just because they're more receptive. Yeah. You know, I mean, just whoever is receptive, whoever wants to hear the gospel, you know, it, it just makes sense to go to them. Look at Acts chapter number 28. And in Acts chapter 28, we find something similar. It says in verse 25, And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed, after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall not hear. And he's talking about the, the people of the Jews. He says, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. Now I find it interesting that, you know, there are three different passages we looked at in Acts where he says that. I'm going to the Gentiles. I'm, I'm not going to give you guys the gospel anymore because you guys don't want to get saved. But it's interesting because one of the times he said earlier in the book, it says that when he said that, the Gentiles were real glad when they heard that. When he said, well, I'm going to the Gentiles because they're receptive. It says the Gentiles were really glad when he said that to them. They were flattered, like, hey, thanks. Glad you like us. You know, we're, we're better. Yeah, great. Okay, but here's what's interesting, though. In this case, he says pretty much the same thing, right? And in this case, it gives the Jews reaction when they hear it. And what does it say the reaction was? That when they heard these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. I mean, that's not a bad reaction because at least they're thinking about it. At least they had great reasoning among themselves. At least they didn't just blow it off and just reject it. At least there's a faction amongst them if they're having reasoning amongst themselves. There's a faction amongst them that's still open to it at that point. So what I'm trying to show you there is that by, by Paul saying, look, I'm going to go to the people that are receptive. If the Gentiles are receptive, that's where I'm going. If, you're unwor if you don't want to hear it, fine, I'll move on. It actually had a good effect on both groups where it made the Gentiles happy that they're going to the Gentiles and respecting them and that they're not second class in the kingdom of God because they're not, because there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. But also, it provoked the Jews unto jealousy to where they basically said, well, maybe we should think about this. You know, and they actually were having some interest at the end. So a lot of people will try to tell you that if you say stuff like this, like, oh, now the Jews will never get saved because you said they're not receptive. You know, you, you, said, that, you said that they blasphemed Jesus. Now they'll never get saved, right? But is that what happened here? Did it say, and so the Jews went away and they were never going to get saved because that's it. No, actually it made them think. It made them stop and think like, oh, wow, we need, to, we need to reason this out. We need to think about this. And it caused great discussion and dispute amongst the Jews when these statements were made. Okay, So what does that show us? It shows us that basically going to people that are receptive is a win-win. You know, because, because basically beating your head against the wall with the people who don't want to hear it isn't helping them get saved anyway. They don't want to hear it. You know, you might as well go to the receptive people. You're going to get more of them saved. And then sometimes when they, with the unreceptive people will see the other people getting saved and it can provoke them to jealousy where they basically want to get in on that. Hey, you know, come talk to me too. You know, I want to hear this too. But this is very practical in a lot of aspects of our lives. First of all, soul winning, obviously. When we go out door knocking, you know, what areas are we picking? And then when we're in that area, who do we spend the time with? And who do we just move on to the next door? Well, the, the, what is the Bible teaching? You know, when it comes to even just nationalities, you know, of just, you know, mi there are missionaries who go to places that are just the most unreceptive possible place, you know? And it's kind of like, well, why are you going there? You know, if, or, or a place, or they'll go to a place where they're like, it's totally illegal to preach the gospel here, but we're going. And we're going to go there, and so we're just going to kind of hide and basically, you know, they'll go there and not really do real soul winning. What they'll do is just like, we'll just have people over to dinner and stuff. And we'll give the gospel to like five people in the course of a year or something. It's real slow work, but it's worth it, you know. But it's like, well, wait a minute. There's seven billion people on the planet. 
people are going to hell. Jesus didn't say, hey, if they persecute you in this city, go underground and start, you know, start doing lifestyle evangelism if soul winning is illegal. Look, it's illegal in Iran to go soul winning. You can't go to Iran and just start, you know, going down the street soul winning. You know, they'll, they'll kill you. You know, I don't know if they would do that to a foreigner, but if their people do it, they'll hang you. They'll kill you. I've talked to people in Iran that confirm, yes, they will kill you if you do soul winning. You know, you're allowed to be a Christian there if you're already a Christian. But you can't do soul winning and you can't convert to Christianity, okay? So here's the thing. I'm not going to say, well, I'm going to go be a missionary to Iran. And I'm going to go there and just hide and just secretly barely give the gospel to somebody every once in a while hiding. It would make way more sense when there are all these people dying and going to hell in areas where it's legal and where it's receptive just to go there and get, the, get a bunch of people saved. And you'll end up getting Iranians saved anyway, no matter where you go. So I've, I've won an Iranian to the Lord, you know, and it, it, because guess what? There are people who come and go from Iran. You know, I mean, the fields are widened to harvest right in Phoenix, Prescott, wherever you are. You'll find people of all nations everywhere. You know, it just makes sense to do it where it's legal, where you can just do it freely, where you can just give the gospel just door after door after door. Just give the gospel to 10 people in one day. Give the gospel to 20 people in one day and just preach and just do everything. You know, there, there are other ministries and things where they say, oh, we're going to go into the public schools and preach. But the only thing is we can't use the name Jesus. We can't say the word Jesus. We can say God, but we can't say Jesus. You know what? Then I refuse to go there. Yeah, yeah, good. You know, because, because that is the name above all names. There is none other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. And you, know, you would never see Peter and John abstaining from using the word Jesus. They were told, hey, don't preach in that name of Jesus. And they said, you know what? We ought to obey God rather than men. We will preach in that name. And you say, well, but then you're going to go to prison. Then go somewhere else. But use the name Jesus and preach it boldly, loudly, proclaim the word of God, hide it under a bushel? No. And so the, we have a great opportunity for us in the United States because compared to a lot of places in the world, even if we might complain about certain areas being unreceptive, compared to the rest of the world, America is pretty receptive. There are a lot of countries where if we were soul winning right now, we'd get a lot less people saved than we do in America. And we'd have a lot less people listening to us. Even if you're in an unreceptive town or an unreceptive neighborhood here, if you look at the big picture, it's actually pretty receptive. Yeah. You know, when you're getting people saved every week. And so, you know, you're kind of, so we have a great opportunity. And, and look, there's no laws against what we're doing here in America. So here we just have this wide open door, this opportunity relatively receptive people, especially if you go to the poor, we need to just take advantage of it. You know, the time is short. The kingdom of God is at hand. You know, let's redeem the time because the days are evil and let's make the most of it and get out there and just get as many people saved as we can Amen. and just preach the gospel to people who want to hear it. Yep. I, it's Hey, it's a lot more fun to give the gospel to somebody who wants to hear it than somebody who doesn't want to hear it. And then you, if you just go to the unreceptive, you just get frustrated. Yeah. And then you want to quit soul winning because you're just like, man, what am I doing? I'm beating my head against the wall. You know, when you go out and get results, it actually makes you like soul winning more. And then actually when you go out and get results, also it inspires other people to want to do more soul winning too. Yeah. You know, when you're getting people saved. And when I say results, I'm saying getting people saved. You know, they're not necessarily going to, you know, uh, join the church. And people say, well, if they don't join the church, they're not really saved. Well, you know, go join Church of Christ then, because that's right. what they believe. Yeah. That you have to get baptized and join the church. But we're Baptists. We believe salvation by faith alone. Yeah. Yeah. And that believing in Jesus is enough to be saved. And, you know, I was just talking to, uh, I think it was Brother Romero. <laughs> he had a visitor come to his church, and it was the visitor's third time coming. Because the visitor had two times driven all the way from across town like a long distance to get there and just chickened out and didn't come to church. And I've had people tell me that. I've had people say, you know, this is actually my second time coming because the first time I showed up for church and I saw the big crowd and I just got scared and left. Because honestly, if you're an unchurched person, it takes guts to just go to a church that you've never been to, you don't know anybody, and just walk in and, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if people are just going to stare at you or, you know. 
So just because people don't come to church doesn't mean that they're not saved. And a lot of times you'll win people to the Lord and they'll go to church with somebody else that they already know. Mm -hmm. Friends that are Christians. And they'll go to the watered down church. But honestly, you know, we want to go out and, and win people to Christ and, and reap a great harvest. You know, that's the goal. When I, I don't go soul losing, I want to go soul winning. Amen. <laughs> Seriously, I want to be winning. <laughs> I want to succeed, you know. <laughs> and so let's do it. We have the opportunity. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for, for just blessing us by letting us live in Arizona. It's a great place, Lord. Uh, a lot of great soul winning that's just right there. The door's wide open, Lord. Help us to just walk through that door and help us to uh, to win people to the Lord. I, I know you said about Corinth that you had much people in that city, but I, I feel the same way about all of Arizona, Lord, that it's a, it's a place that's wide unto harvest. So please just help us to do our best, Lord, and, and to uh, spend time on that house that's worthy and on that town that's worthy. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.